Does Ghana even have a refinery? It's just the Chinese people that came to build it. So we are not worried about whether certain prices or not. We're just we're just more interested in giving the whole thing to someone and taking 10%. That is the so-called experienced politicians that you're talking about. And if a young man, Lanana Bidiakon, stands up and says, Nation, listen to me. I am here to dedicate my life. He wants to be president of this country. Nana Kwame Bidiakon. We have a lot of questions for him. Why he wants to be president, his ambitions, so, so, so many questions. And um, I asked you guys to tweet your questions using the hashtag Kali J Space. So I, I, I took some questions from the audience to ask him. So most of the questions are not even coming from me. They are coming from you. Also, at the end of the space, I will open the platform where you guys can come on and ask questions. Um to him and he will, he will answer personally to you. I, I want the space to be um, respectful. We should respect one another's opinions and we should, we should give room for um, opinions, actually. Um, let's, let's, be, let's not use vulgar words. If you have any comments, suggestions, opinions, use the hashtag Kali J Space and then let's, let's, let's rack the numbers up. But tonight we have Nana Kwame Bediako, popularly known as Freedom Jacob Caesar, um, Tether coming on college space 7 p.m. exactly. He'll be on the space. We'll be hosting the space for close to two hours. Questions will be asked, questions will be answered. I know a lot of you um, have opinions about him. A lot of people don't know him. A lot of people just see him like his pictures and his videos on social media, but they haven't heard him actually speak. So tonight is going to be is going to be one of a kind. I think this is the very first time in the history of this country that a presidential candidate is interacting with the youth on Twitter spaces or on the digital space like at um, Twitter. Um, welcome to Kali Day Space. Thank you, Kali. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, we, we appreciate you for making this audience with us and also our followers. So, guys, um, Nana Kwame Bediako is on here on Kali J Space. Share the link. Let your friends know he's on. They should come and listen to him speak and ask questions. There, there are a lot of questions here that I also have to ask him. And I have my co-host on here as well, Austin Wood. Austin. Yeah, Kali, good, good evening to you and good evening to everyone who's joining us in the space and also... Um, the person we are hosting, Nana Kwame Bidiako. Good evening, sir. Good evening. How are you? I'm doing well, and I hope you are doing fine, too. By his grace, all is well. Uh, thank God. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, I'll, I'll ask a few questions, then Austin will ask his questions. Then um, we, we pick it from there. We have our audience also ask questions. Once in a while, if you have, if Austin has anything to input, any inputs or any questions, he can come in. If I also have any questions or inputs, I'll come in and, and we set the ball rolling. So um, first of all, I want to ask, for those who aren't familiar with you, please tell us who Nana Kwame Bediako is. Who Nana Kwame Bediako, Cheddar, Freedom Jacob Caesar, who is he? Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank you for hosting me on this platform. And uh, I also like to thank the co-host for you two joining and giving me this opportunity to um, let some of the people who are on here to find out who I am. Well, Nana Kwame Bediako, I am married with four children. Um, I'm a real estate entrepreneur. Uh, I do philanthropic works and um, I grew up religious, um, going to church almost every Sunday. So. I'm a Christian, and um, uh, since last year, I decided to pursue my calling as a as a leader. And that's it, really. Okay, so I want to ask, um, what 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 um, made the decision? What gave you the um, the conviction that yeah, it is time for me to become um, a leader of this country. Why? And I, I feel you you went, you started, you said your, it was just last year, then you started straight and you went to presidential ambitions. Why didn't you start from like maybe the parliamentary and build your way up? Because first of all, my vision was not to be a politician. It was a calling. And um, 
you know, I was enjoying my business. I was enjoying my life. Um, but uh, there are things in the past that have had similar callings that go to Africa, go to Ghana, start this instead of doing this, stop this and go here. And all of that has moved me from where I used to be to different heights in life. So I listened to the voice and uh, the voice didn't tell me that go and start becoming an assemblyman and try to become a minister and then, then you become this and that. It's just said that, you know, uh, go and make sure that whatever that it is, the youth of this country, whatever you know, that can help, that can create jobs, that can build that industrial, you know, economy that would bring value to humanity, just go straight and do it. So I sort of, not to say put my business aside and everything, but since then, this has been my full-time concentration. I still do my business. I still work um, nine to five every day and sometimes even further till nine. Uh, but more so seriously, I concentrate on um, this ambition. Great. So um, I also want to I want to I want to ask this. Um, throughout your message, I've been I've been following your 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 journey throughout your um, the political space so far, and I realized your core message has been more of industrialization. Why industrialization, and how do you plan on implementing this? Oh, thank you very much. Um, so to to all those who are listening, you know this could be the very moment that we should all go back to do some research on every developed country in this world that we call it a first class country and find out how the country was developed how the people began to have a middle class life you know when you don't industrialize your minerals both your human resource and your mineral resources it's very difficult to build an economy and if you don't build an economy, it's very difficult to manage your people or, or should I say, the nation to even build them. And if you can't build a nation, then you're going to face a lot of issues such as inflation, currency depreciation, and many more of the things that have got, gotten Ghana in the struggle that we're in today. So if you go to America, they did the same thing in their history or before they became commercialized, they went through industrialized uh, vision to get here. If you go to England, it's the same. If you go to um, uh, Europe, it's the same. China, the same. India, it's the same. The last continent that I can say they've gone through a phase of industrial revolution is the Emirates. And you can see Sharjah. Sharjah helped build Dubai. You know, Sharjah is not as good looking and uh, or as developed as dubai is but that's the strength of dubai it was the industrial platform that developed it so for me i just think that if we Ghanaians or blacks let me say africa in general if we try to dodge or run away from this fact that we need to go through a phase of industrialization before we can go to commercialization you know our the urban development uh they, all the other de social development, human development, it all goes through these phases. And this is where we acquire skill set and then a change of mindset, you know, a mentality issue. All of that is through industrialization. And this also brings like a middle class lifestyle, a middle income uh, salary, because these jobs are guaranteed for the next 20 to 30, 50 years once you start it. Okay, thank and, you then, and then the and, second and, part is how yeah. am I going to implement it? I am already implementing it. As you see, I started 10, no, 12 years ago in Takradi doing acquisition. And acquisition is one of the first things that I learned in the real estate. You know, that is me studying the land policy to understand how to acquire a land. You know, the, the sort of uh, challenges that you go through just become an owner of a land and for me i had to put 65 different families 11 subdivisional chiefs one chief and then the overall commission of land 
to be able to acquire this parcel, which is 2,000 acres. And it took me three and a half years. You know, these are some of the things that I believe that the youth of this country should also understand that if we're going to go into development, which is investment and development, this is the sort of degree that we have to acquire in life. I mean, the best university in life is life. And these are the things that we have to learn when we come to the real world after our education, practically, these are the things that we have to do. And so I went through that phase and then I started something called um, basic infrastructure and then crop compensation to pay the crops on the land. And then after I went into uh, EPA and then uh, I went into things like permit for construction. And then I started doing the basic infrastructure for gutters, ICT. So it's, it's a long process and it's a whole lot of commitment. And I had to go through that. I'm sure that people in Africa are beginning to realize that if we don't have these industrial platforms, we will never be able to create the right value for our people. You know, I had this vision, you know, early uh, before I even turned 30. You know, and uh, I believe that we are going to go that, through that phase and hopefully the, the fourth industrial revolution will spark and kick off very well in Africa. Thank you very much. Um, I want to ask you this. Um, personally, looking at our current state as a nation, we, we, I think we are retrogressing as a nation. Do you believe it's um, corruption or incompetence or... Um, but what what do you really think is the main problem? Because if you look at our resources, we are we are really blessed as a nation. So why are we in this state as a country? Well, once a machine starts to break down, it could be one fault. But then if you don't fix that fault and forced to use the machine, then it can develop another fault and more fault and more fault. And finally, it will break down. For you to fix it, you have to overhaul it. I think Ghana is going through that phase now. So there's been corruption. There's been so many other things. You know, there's been interfering with the law. You know, the judiciary system and the legislation of this country should be protected. As a government, they need to protect that. And then the parliament, which is supposed to be the executive arm that supports this nation, these things cannot be touched, neither by politicians or by workers or by directors of these companies. Because one thing that Ghana should respect and understand is that politicians will come and go. They only work for four years. So it's like a company having a CEO. You know, if they perform four years and they do well, they can do another four years. But after eight years, maybe the rule or the constitution says that they have to go. However, the government would always exist as long as the country exists. So we might be in our 30s and 40s now. The government will be there till we're 80 and we die and go, and they will still be there. So it's very important that we consider the responsibilities, the accountabilities of the government of this country, and let's not biasly interfere those regulations and constitutions, because it comes back to affect us. And I'll give you an example. Um, you know, since I started my campaign, I can see that, you know, there are a lot of people who are into journalism and all of that. And it's like they work for someone else. They don't work for the country. And I believe that media is supposed to be the facts of this nation or, in fact, the world. What the media is bringing out should be telling us the truth, that we found the facts. If they start twisting and playing with it, that could affect the country. Um you know, that could affect the country in a way that you might think that we are going back backwards now. That's one. Uh, two, I also think that um, there are things in a country that if we were to give the chance for the nation to be able to occupy that space, for instance, the private sector of this country, if it can grow itself, you know, if it can become uh, a business like uh, we not being contractors for the same uh, sitting government, or should I call them uh, politicians that come to power, you know, if we can start building ourselves that way, we will start to understand development properly. And then I think it would reduce corruption and all of these issues because people are corrupt. Some, most people are corrupt because they don't have value. You know, if they only have 1,000 cities or 2,000 cities at the end of the month and they have to spend 
1,500 to buy fuel. What about the electricity and the water bill that keeps going up and all the other things, the school fees for the mothers and everything? You know, this is very difficult for Ghanaians. And some of the corruption is coming from here because they, they, their ends means it's not enough to take care of the family. And we're making it very difficult. I think we need to build Ghana properly and start to give people the chance to have, you know, at least an average value that they can survive on. And it would reduce a lot of things. Great. Um, listening to your earlier submission, you said you had a calling to be the president of this country. I want to ask you, why didn't you join MPP or NDC to to fight for your for, for this position? And also, if you are to be elected as president, are you going to work with either MPP or NDC to make your um, policies come to life? Well, I first of all, I think that uh, there could be a lot of potential in both parties. However, it depends how it's used. You know, um, there could be some great guys there with great ideas who are willing to work, but maybe um, they don't have the opportunity to express themselves in, or, or to extend, you know, their potential um, vision and knowledge into into the development of this country. Uh, I think to answer your question about why didn't I join any of the two, I did look for the past 40 years and I asked myself the question, why haven't they done anything that would turn this country around? And that's what stopped me from thinking that I should join any of the two because you know, there were so many things that they could have done with the 15 other regions in this country to make it active in order to boost our economy, you know. And boosting an economy doesn't mean that you can boost it from one region, which is Accra. You know, you need to boost all the other regions and make sure that there is some sort of development going on there. There is some sort of job creation going on there. And then there is some returns. You're making use of whatever resources that is in that particular region. And then when you sort of consolidate all the national efforts and contribution of its resources, it boosts your uh, economy. Uh, I couldn't see that in a country and um, I just needed to build my own movement and be able to stand in in my own corner and um, see the kind of people that can relate to me. And that's how the new force was coming up. Like we wanted to see that if the youth are looking for this, if they're looking for jobs, if they're looking to industrialize themselves, if they're looking to get themselves out of the situation that our fathers have put us in, so we can think about how we can move into the future before someone takes over our land or our country. And, and I think it's out of this feeling and strength, it's what has built the new force, you know, all together, just to see the people out there and how they think, if they still want to be governed in the old ways, or we want to find a new ways where we can catch up with the world in terms of develop, developing ourselves in the technological world, in the industrial world, in the financial sector, you know, all sort of things in this world that I can see other countries doing better. Thank you very much. Um, now, um, Austin, um, do you have any questions? Yeah, thank you. Um, Nana, um, there is this saying that first impressions count. And in introducing yourself to the Ghanaian people that you want to be president, it first starts with the man behind the mask. Um, it seemed it's celebrity-like. Is looking for fame like, but running a country as a president is serious business. Don't you think that what you did with billboards splashed all over the place behind the mask uh, has affected how Ghanaians have seen you or accepted your campaign to be a serious one? And what is what is behind trying to be behind the mask when you want to be a president of Ghana? What what went into that decision? 
Okay. So first of all, I would like to know the exact question you're asking me because one is you saying that it's celebrity like and one is are you still trying to ask me what is behind the mask or you know, no. I, I just want you to okay. kind of so fix your I'm question saying, properly, yeah. Austin. Okay. And okay. I, I appreciate how you put it and everything, but I just wanted okay. to No clarify. problem. Okay, L let me explain it. I'm saying that that kind of unveiling is done by celebrities. Okay. But being a leader of a country, a president is serious business. Okay. Why did you take a decision to announce yourself to be president to the Ghanaian people that way? And do you think that has affected how people have received your message and your candidature to be either serious or non-serious? All right. Thank you very much. So first of all, I think, you know, talking about seriousness, there are a lot of people who are leaders in this country and are not very serious, not serious in many ways, but people don't talk about that. You know, I needed you to find out about me quicker than you can think of, you know, and if you look back, the mask has only been out for five months, but it's also the reason why we're on this platform talking right now. It might look like celebrity, it might sound childish, but when you go back to history, you're going to find out that our four forefathers, our great great grandfathers and mothers had a mask on. You know, we had something covering our face, you know, by painting our faces. And through that, you read the signs there. So you can understand what culture does this person belong to? You know, what family are they coming from? What is their history? I was not only sending a message to Ghanaians, I was also sending a message to the Western world. And if you do your research properly, you will find out that today, this mask and this new force is the only group or movement that has come up and has made it to financial times, has made it to Italian, to America and different places. And then in parts of Africa, you can tell that as in popularity, we have gained the most. So if it's about celebrity, then I've made a political celebrity uh, become an existence in the first time in history. Um, you know, uh, if Financial Times wrote about the mass campaign, which used to be my dream when I was young, that when would I get in Financial Times? And when I inquired, they told me that to put my passport picture there and then put my story there will cost me a million dollars. They gave me four pages for free because they wanted to know my story. So I think maybe from what you're saying, you might be right. The Ghanaians might see it some way, you know, with all the mask and everything. But I think it's also time that I let people know that they should not worry about the messenger. More so, they should keep their ears open for the message because that's what is important. I think we're letting perception overcome you know, the, the vision that we have and how we have to turn that vision into reality. You know, I, I don't think that the new force is a gimmick. And as you can see, it's really shaking the industry, the political industry especially. Um, there are so many things that, you know, has been canceled and is being followed and, you know, trying. But that tells you that your time has come as a youth. There is now people paying attention to the youth. And I want everybody that is listening to me to understand this, that this country, we are making history together because after this moment, there are going to be a lot of youth who are younger than me that will come up with similar platforms, similar movements, and we're gonna go together, be strong together, and change the narrative of our political uh, 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 political narrative and make it a better uh, politics for people to understand that politics is not to, to extract things from your country, to go into politics. Politics is everywhere. Politics is in, in, in our churches, is in our schools, is our, our workplace. However, when you come to this industry where you become responsible and accountable for a country, you need to understand that you're responsible to develop the country and build a nation. So it is a task that is given to people. And we need to understand that that is the purpose. It is not promises. It is the purpose of you 
coming to add value to society, making sure that you build nations so you're remembered, your legacy does not leave the country, all the people, all their great-great-grandchildren. That are the things that I stand for. I stand for these things. So you are, the people of the nation, the people around, even in and outside, should not worry about how I look or what I'm wearing. But what is behind the mask right now, I think we know. And I am laying out my policies, even though most of them are being... Uh, yeah, Nana, respectfully, I would come to that. Yeah. But in, in, in a follow-up question to how you have answered, mm -hmm. I think that everybody in this space would appreciate that your response is about you being in the financial times. It's about a dream for you. It's about the marketing. I, I did mention There's that no is way the new, you have drawn I did mention, a correlation between the mask thing and the marketing strategy and your presidential ambition and how Ghanaians you see it as a serious one. It's all about what you wanted to achieve being in the financial times because you see, anybody can do anything that would put them in the financial times. There have been Ghanaians who have been in the financial times. But you want to be the president of the Republic of Ghana. If you are coming as a man behind a mask, do you think that being in the Financial Times and uh, marketing being talked about elsewhere is what the Ghanaian people living in Ashama, Tumu, Hamile, Hafasini, Akumadan in my village care about? Listen, listen, let me, let me just tell you this, Austin. What do you think? that campaign is about campaign simply means marketing okay so if i come on this platform first of all i only don't need to market myself i need to market my movement market my country market the people and even unveil what we are going through economically we are struggling we're struggling we're suffering we're falling so the mask is out there it's making people pay attention to our politics. Some people might have problems with it. Some people might like it. I think maybe you could not see, you might not see it the way I'm seeing it. But I think the point I'm trying to make is that new force coming out just in November. And we are in May. We just, I mean, we just gone into June. Okay. Barely six months. Barely six months. But the world is finding out about it. For me, I think it's an achievement in a way that a lot of people have tried with independent platform and they still haven't been heard of. People haven't heard their voice. We have come in with the great marketing strategy to be able to reach people. You know, the reaching is important, like you were mentioning, all those places that need to hear about us. Yes, we're working hard and they're also hearing about us. But this is the part that I'm telling you that is taking us out of the boundaries of Ghana. And it's good. It's a good achievement for us. We are grateful for getting this far. And I, with the benefits that could come out of this, would we'll still be for Ghanaians and it's not going to be for ourselves. It's for us. Okay. Thank you. My next question to you, uh, thank you, Nana, is um one of the challenges we face as a country when it comes to uh, political party funding is um it's been opaque and the electoral commission that is to check this has not been able to do it to the satisfaction of the ordinary Ghanaian um political parties would give their end of year statements to be uh, vetted by the electoral commission the new force launched a campaign where you are asking Ghanaians to pay in, uh, into an account monies that would help run the campaign so that it, the campaign would look like it belongs to all of us we are helping with it because political campaigns do cost a lot and if you check the cdd uh, last report on it um, a presidential candidate is spending close to 100 million Ghana cities for a full campaign and an MP is spending um, close to a million or, and above. I'm asking this, is there a plan to um, show to the Ghanaian people donating to this cause 
at every point in time, let's say after every month, after every three months, you would account to us how much that um, um, account we are sowing into has accrued. Okay, thank you very much, Austin. Even though you have very long questions like essay questions, I'll still take my time and, you know, pick the point and answer you. So the main reason why we did this was is part of changing the narrative of politics in this country. You know, we wanted people to understand that you have to contribute or donate into uh, the leader or the president. You know, you see, the people make the government and the people vote the president into the system. But why should the people be bribed before they vote? Why should the people be paid before they vote? This has been going on for four decades. So first of all, we wanted to change it, reverse it. And it started. It might not be so big this time, but all the other people who are going to come up after this would understand that let's not go and pay anybody to vote us. Let the people rather invest in us. Let them invest or donate to us and let them put us in power. That's one. The second thing, it's accountability and responsibility. We, the New Force, believe that if the nation, we're going to rule the nation or lead the nation or govern the nation or whatever that we have to do, we have to start practicing what we're preaching. And that is accountability and responsibility. Our first investment could have come from the founder, but that's me being accountable for my own funds that is invested. But now we are giving the chance to the public to say that, okay, this is very transparent, it's very visible, and it's very accessible. It's never been done in the past history in, in, in politics. So why don't we do this together so everyone could have the chance to know and see what is exactly what you're talking about, how the money will be used, the cost of campaign, the things to do to help whilst we're going through the campaign, how the money was used, how I come back and be accountable for people's funds. And that's what we're here to introduce. So that's what the Ghana Save is about. And um, I believe that uh, maybe some other leaders might have tried to raise funds, but never made it accessible, uh, transparent, and making people know that this is what I'm going to use your money for. Or if someone came to give them millions just to support their campaign, is because maybe after that they have to give them millions in contracts back to, to pay them back. But we don't want that. We want to change. We feel like we should deal with the average human not just the elite or not just some important people in this country. We believe that everybody should be important, from the disabled to the able, from the poor to the rich, the sick, everyone should be able. And this is what governance is about. It's not bias. It's not discriminative. It's just natural. It's just you helping humanity and adding value to it. And so I would like to say that it's not in our interest to do this campaign strictly by using our funds. We want the nation to be part of it. You know, we want to do it together with the nation. Thank you, Austin. Yeah, thank you. Um, Austin, I think he's breaking up. Um, let me pick a few questions from the audience, then I'll come back with my questions as well. So we have Kesi on here. Um, Kesi, let's hear your question. Hello, 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 hello Kali J. Yeah. Yeah, respectfully, I'm saying that I asked oh. about the current donations we are making towards the campaign. When okay. is he going to account to us? Is it going to pe be periodic or is it going to be after the elections? That That is the question I'm asking. Timelines for accounting okay. to us. Okay. Okay. The, um, the, the, the thing that the, the, the platform is opened. Do you understand what I'm saying? So is that. Once we start our campaign, you know, which we're about to do, whatever that at that moment Ghana has put in there, whether it's a million, we're trying to raise 100, 50 million, uh, 80 million, 100 million, or 30,000 cities, whatever the money is, would be accounted for. At the moment, it's there, it's open, and people are 
uh, donating, and I want to say I'm grateful for Ghanaians for donating. I've donated myself, some friends I have. Um, but once we start using the money, that accountability will come, and it won't come at the end. You know, whatever that that money will go into, we would know because it's up to December. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, Austin, let me pick a few questions from okay. the audience. Okay. Then um, we come back. So, um, Kesi, um, let's hear from you. All right. Thank you very much, Kali. I hope everyone is able to hear me. Um, first, I would say thank you very much, Nana Bidiako, for joining us today. Um, yeah. we, we welcome you as the first presidential candidate to participate in Kali J Space. You know, as, as you are aware, Kali has a following of about 2 million. So that's a great opportunity for you to come here and share your vision with us. Uh, my name is Kwabna Kesi Animadu. I am the founder and president of Greatness in You, a nonprofit based in Las Vegas, USA. Our organization supports youth education development in Africa and mostly in Ghana. We provide scholarship, tuition, and living assistance to needy students. I have a few questions for you. I've been looking forward to the space and I'm glad you're all here today. So I hope Kali would permit me to ask a few questions. Uh, my, my question number one that I have for you, which I think you have touched based on, um, you know, we've had great leaders in the past, such as Kwame Nkrumah and more recent years, J.A. Kufour, who has spearheaded the agenda of better Ghana. My question to you is, why do you want to be president of Ghana? And what would you do differently from the current leadership? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I wasn't born to be a president. And the greatest people in this world were not born great. They grew great. So while I was growing, I started appreciating greatness. And when I look back in leadership, yes, like you said, and Chroma Kufour, they have done some great things in this country. And then if there are people that you think haven't done great, that alone should push and should uplift some of us to say that let's not repeat our father's mistakes. Let's fulfill their dreams. Let's go ahead and build what they couldn't build. It's not because they couldn't build. It's because you are there to do it. So, you know, in the youth sector, I gathered the courage. You know, I gathered myself together and said that this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do it because I fall in the sector of the youth. But I am even thinking about the ones who are not even born yet, because looking at how we're going in terms of development, if we are sort of going backwards in development, then by the time our children, they grow to our age or they have children, that could be worse. So it's one of the, the things that has, you know, given me this um, strength and this sort of upliftment to become a president. Now, how different would I be a president? That is a very good question coming from the audience, that how different would I be? I would just continue from someone like Kwame Nkrumah. So first of all, when you look at Nkrumah, when he started developing Ghana, he started something in Tema, and it was called an industrial platform. Out of that industrial platform came the transportation hub, which is Tema Community One. They started to take cars because they had jobs, okay? And then they started building Community Two. They realized that they needed to build like apartments and, 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 and where they would live. And then they kept building Community Three, Community Four. Today, Nkrumah has been dead and gone over 60 years. And Tema is now Community 25. So it's still going as a city, it's still growing. And you have most of Ghana's generating income coming from that base, Tema. Tema generates money, a lot of funds from Tema, more than even Accra, okay? And that is because of that industrial platform that is there. When you're talking about almost everything that comes into this country, you know, they ship it through there. And almost every single fabrica uh, fabrication and the development, all things that you're doing in the industrial sector comes from Tema. The point that I'm trying to make is that did any of the leaders or most of the leaders that came after Nkrumah, did they decide to continue this industrial vision in other places like all the other regions or that hasn't been done? Because if that, if you realize that hasn't been done, then you know exactly what I've come to do. I am here to continue 
that vision of industrialization, making sure that our industrialized mind is part of our mentality, how we're going to be developed as human beings. And that is going to cut one big thing, which is the biggest issue of this country, importation. The government might like importation because every time you're hit with a tax when you bring any goods into this country and the government will make money. But you have to remember that the people that they're paying the taxes are also going to extract whatever funds and go back and give it to whoever they bought the machine or bought the food or bought the product or bought the cars from. Okay, so this is something that we should think about. How do we cut importation and now start to have the power of exportation? Remember, when we start to export from our country, we would also be extracting people's economy into our country. And that makes us powerful. So this is how I intend to be a president with this sort of governance, you know, young, fresh blood that is ready to industrialize, to develop, to build. And as you can already see that if you look at my track record now, what I do, my forte is investment and development. It's something that I've gotten used to. In fact, I am tired of just doing development from a private sector perspective or level. I want to go into the bigger space, which is the government. And I can definitely let Ghanaians understand that I'm not saying this as a promise. It's a purpose. It's probably the experience I've gained in the past 22 years of my life. I want to continue. I want to share this knowledge. I want to share this experience. I want the youth to remember this that you don't have to let anybody tell you that you have to be 60 before you become a leader or a president or, or to own your own business. You don't have to go through uh, seven different steps before you can fulfill your vision or your dream or who you want to become. And as much as we want to become who we are thinking to be, we should go with that guts. We should go with that courage. We should have that focus. Life is not life. Is the time you have in life and how you use it. So there's some people who are waiting, thinking that their time is going to come. Please, our time is now. Your time is now. And just jump on the train. Let's all go. I believe that industrialization is going to change Ghana and not only Ghana, all the African countries who adapt to it. Because since Kwame Nkrumah gave us the first independence, everybody followed it. Freedom, Jacob Caesar. Nana, Kwame Bediako. I am coming to continue and introduce the industrialization on a platform where we will create the biggest international commercial relationships with the world. And this is the beginning of a spark of a revolution in terms of industrialization. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm getting feedbacks that some of you are not hearing the sound. Um, if you are not hearing, please close the app and refresh your data and come back online because it's working perfectly. Um, I'm picking the next question from Ya Benewa. Okay, thank you, Kali, for the opportunity to ask my question. So, um, Nana Kwame Bidiako, I just want to know, you've spoken a lot about industrialization. And most of you here will agree with me that this is um, one of the ideas that this current government um, sold to us. And currently, the country is in a serious mess. There's a lot of fixing that we need. So I want to know what your plans are, your key steps or actions are going to be to, first of all, take us out of the mess we are in. I want to know how you are going to fix the country in the short term. And then I believe industrialization is going to be a long term plan. So I want to know exactly how you are going to go about it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I just want to ask you one question before you go. You said that the sitting government came up with industrialization as in your manifesto. Yes, they sold uh, I, that idea to us through one district, uh, one factory, and all of that. Yeah, that that, but that was not a developmental plan. That it's a promise. We're talking about a developmental plan here, agenda. Okay, that is the industrialization. Of course, I heard that maybe the sitting government is talking about digitalization. 
um, but not industrialization. Industrialization, it's, it's probably not going to be somebody saying that I'll build a factory for you, okay? Industrialization is basically, first of all, you take the stock and the reserves of your minerals in an area. You look at the size of your land and then you see its potential in terms of farming, agriculture, what you can do, the seven steps of agriculture, not just agri, but including the culture, you know, and that is you picking the cocoa and doing the seven different processes to create different type of things with it. You have to mix it with different petrochemicals and other chemicals. You can create cocoa butter, you can create the shampoo, you can create the milo, the tea, all of that. So other people in this world can come and buy the same product that you're buying in England from you because it's a recipe. So once you go through the industrial process, that's when you create the product. So now this is just commercial products. Let's come to personal products, like we go to technology, okay? If we decide to industrialize technology in our country, we will be building data centers and we will be building factories that is going to fabricate hardware, software, and all the internal stuff that makes a mobile phone and a laptop. So we can actually build iPhones here and then it has to be shipped from here to another country because you have places like China, uh, maybe Finland and all of these places who are producing the same iPhones and they sell it to you and you buy it. It comes to Ghana, it goes to Nigeria, but it's being produced in one of these countries. How are they producing it? It's because they've gone into industrialization where they put the plants, they build the plants. Some plants can produce 70,000 bottles an hour. Okay? That is one of that. These are some of the parts of industrialization. Now, to do this, first of all, you need to remember one thing. Without energy, you can't do a lot of things. And even if you have the energy, you need to work on the tariffs. There is commercial tariffs, there are residential tariffs, and then there is the industrial tariff. If your industrial tariff is too expensive, nobody will come to your country. Like for instance, if you check America, America's tariff for industrialization is between six to eight cents. Now, Americans have a combination of windmill. They have... Um, uh, they have uh, other things like dam, and then they're adding all different types, solar. They keep adding things to it. So they find a better way to create, like, uh, uh, is it uh, energy with power stations, okay? There is semiconductors and chips that Taiwan is creating for the whole world. There are just that the whole world but they need the energy to be able to produce these things in millions and they need the plants and this is where the jobs come from this is where the average person is paid so uh, if i say to you that i am going to build a factory and i don't know what the sources are, the resources that are going to go in there and how it will be manufactured and who and what are the demands for it, then it's probably just a promise. I think that the process of doing this is what we need to go through. That industrialization phase I'm talking about, this is what it is. If we decide tomorrow to build, let's say, a methanol plant in Ghana, we need to say that what is the cost of a methanol plant? If it's going to cost us 290 million, do we have the resources that will feed the methanol plant? And if we do, what are the returns? It can say that, okay, the returns is 180 million a year. So in the third year, we would have gotten our investment back and made profit, but we would have created 10,000 jobs for the methanol plant. And besides, we will have reserves to use the methanol plant product, which is petrochemicals, to do many other things, such as medicine and other things. And that's that's what industrialization, and that's this is what I know about it, and this is how it would be implemented. And that's where the job creation will come from. 
That's where the wealth creation will come from. That's where the enlightenment will come from. That's where the industrialized mindset and skill set will come from. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, um, Austin. Um, let's 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 hear a few questions. Then I'll ask my questions. Okay. Uh, no, no. One of the challenges Ghana faces is dealing with corruption, and um, it has bedeviled this country since um, colonial times and after independence. Every president we have had has talked about ways to fix this canker, uh, but still is bedeviled us. It, it is destroying us. Okay, so your question do, is corruption. What will you do about corruption and how do you intend to fix it when you become president? Okay. So I think I've answered this question way too many times, but I will do it again. And I think for this time, people would probably think about it. Corruption comes from you just taking value away from people. Okay? When you force someone or push them into a corner where they can't afford for life, it's not like they wanted to be thieves. You know, they force or they try to find any means to survive. And sometimes it leads them to just being biased or corrupt. Okay? And for instance, if you look at the average salary for a Ghanaian, it's difficult for the average Ghanaian to also survive. Why? Because when I compare that to the cost of their living, which is specified by the government's requirements, for instance, if we are paying uh, three cities for 30 liters of water, and then the family of four is going to consume maybe 800 liters a month, 8,000 liters a month. So you have to times that and divide it by 30, and that could come up to 500 or 800 cities. But if you're paying this person 2,000 cities and they have to pay for their transport, which the fuel is 1,000 something to fill the tank, and then they have to pay for the fees of their children, and they have to look after their wife, and they have to feed themselves. It makes it so difficult for them to survive on that small amount, which is what I think is our number one problem. That we need to move the nation to the middle income economy. How can we do that? One of the main things that changes this whole thing, it's industrial. Because you need a guaranteed job, something that as soon as you leave university, there is already an occupancy for you or a vacancy for you for sorry a vacancy for you to join uh, a factory a company something that is bringing national revenue okay but we don't have most of that so most of our people are either government workers who would have just the basic salary or people are working in shops or some multinational that have come to build their company in Ghana, MTN, Zenith Bank, this, that, you know, everything is outside and they give you the same minimum wage. I'm sure by the time our children would also grow and go to these schools and go to England and or America and come back, they will come back and they will join one of these companies and they'll still give you that minimum salary because we're missing this industrial power in the middle. We need to do it. We need to build it. We need to continue from where Nkrumah left off because that's where it's going to, that's what is going to take us to the average salary that we need, not the minimum salary that we're struggling. So these are some of the things that will stop corruption. Two, I think that if the corruption is starting from the top of the country, if the governmental institutions or some political leaders are corrupt, it affects the nest in command and the nest in command and the nest and the nest and the nest and it triggers down. So we as a country also, it's time we get our minds right, our mindset right, how we want to develop our people, how we want to develop our country. But first, we need to start to be accountable and feel responsible for the nation that is put in our hands. And if we have an accountable government, then a wrong leader can be judged. They can be justified. 
okay? So then people will start to sit up. But if we also sit down and let the same politicians control the government that can question them, then I don't know whether we're going or coming. So these are some of the things that we believe as the new force, you know, we have to put in place once we get the chance to lead this country. We have to make sure that all of these things are put in place. Thank you. Okay. Uh, a follow-up to that, Nana, respectfully, um, when you check the CDD and other uh, recognized bodies, Ghana Integrity Initiative, the uh, Corruption Perception Index, um, you have individual corruption perception way below the, la the, uh, the ladder. It has to do with institutional, like the judiciary, the executive, uh, the police and all that. I am asking you, the attorney general, which you will be appointing, because that is the only ministerial position in the constitution, is the only person who can prosecute someone for criminal offenses. What will you do with the office of the attorney general and minister of justice? Because there's been conversation of decoupling it because the attorney general will find it difficult prosecuting a fellow cabinet minister or a member of Nana Kwame Biediako's government. What is your view on that? That is, I think I've already answered you with that, that the government should not be interfered with. You know, these are institutions that will forever exist in the country. You know, as long as we're living, we have to remember that we will be governed by these institutions. And whatever constitutions that is embedded in our system needs to be respected because that is what will protect the human rights and the citizenship rights of this country. So if there is... Uh, an attorney general and is they're good and they're honest for the country, one should not change them just because they've come to power. You know, that person or that cabinet can help the country go forward as long as they're doing the right thing. You know, I think that the twist of making sure that every politician comes and change everything around the system, that's one thing that we are now having to bear the consequences for that. You know, I, I don't think that's what they're practicing in other parts where other parts of the world that they practice democracy. You know, you can't just come and move everyone and place everyone there because of your own interest. And that's that's what answers the question that you're asking that, you know, they will find it hard to to prosecute someone because they've been put there for a reason. I, I don't believe in that. I think that, you know, even at some point, if there are some good MPP or NDC members that would join um, New Force because they believe in the vision, yes, they're more than welcome. And I, I don't think that, you know, everything should be about a party. It should be about the country. It should be about the nation. It should be about the people. Once we start to have this mentality, I think we're going to have clear conscience to understand what what governance is. And, and that's the sort of leadership that we should look for as a country and also in a black society. Okay, my last question before Kali moves to another. Ghana has gone through economic crisis in the last three years. We've gone for an IMF program. Uh, we've done a debt, domestic debt exchange program and we are doing the external one. If you check our trajectory, the domestic ex the debt exchange program, a lot of the payments will be happening um, when you become president from 2025. There will be budget constraints. We are even failing to deal with budget deficits annually. Mm -hmm. You would want to create jobs as you are talking about the industrial revolution. You'd want to pay people well. How are you going to fund all of these things? Because the Ghanaians are also complaining about the myriad of taxes that have been imposed on us since COVID times, and we are also suffering. What ways, in genuine ways, will you map up to be able to store up our revenue when you become president, looking at the challenges we would be facing when you are president come 2025? So first of all, I think that, you know, we need to accept that anyone that is going to lead this country up from from this very moment is going to inherit the biggest debt 
Okay? So you shouldn't run away from that, and that shouldn't scare you. What you should be thinking is that, how can I pay my debt off, and how can I cancel some of this contract and cancel some of these bad debts, you know, so we can be debt-free? But to do so, you first of all need to take account of your attributable reserves. Your proven reserves are already being touched by, you know, a lot of foreign entities. And the only reason why they're able to do that in your country is because you have foreign influence attacking your political regimes and narratives, your plans for a country. So you don't end up governing your country the way you're supposed to because somebody from outside is telling you what to do. You need to understand what you have from in within. That's the first thing that you need to put aside. And see, when you inherit a company that is broke but has potential, has properties, you will see that some of the properties could be worth millions, but it wasn't being managed right. So you need to put all of those things together and see how you can create this wealth in within first, not go out. Everybody that becomes a leader is following the same strategy, going out there to financial institutions and saying, yes, we need help because we owe money. Give us money so we can build our country. You can't borrow money to build your country. I'm sorry, Austin. Okay, you use the resources in your country to build your country. In fact, you extract other resources from outside if it, if it may need to be so just to boost your production. Your production is what quantifies your economy, okay? Your economy is based on the revenue that circulates in your system, not the revenue that is taken out of your system. If it's going to grow, it grows that way. So personally, I think that Ghana really needs a CEO and not a politician. Ghana needs someone that understands business and how to create jobs and how to create wealth. That's the thing that we're running away from. We think that politicians are experienced because they have been politicking for how many years and running around and doing campaigns and all of that. No, we need to face reality. We need to understand that, look, we need to build our businesses. But if banks are being canceled, but it's not being, uh, uh, microfinances was 3.9 billion, and only in 80 months, we go back to the World Bank and beg them for 3 billion. 80% of the same money that we closed and gave it away, or we don't know where it went to. You know, all of these decisions are not so important to me that we closing what we have than we rebuilding what we have. You know, that is the belief that I am coming into this country with. That is the sort of experience, that is the sort of hope that I want people to understand that, look, bring back the factories, bring back all of that, create the jobs, start getting the money, start taking money from the Western world as well, but let them buy it in a semi price. Okay, let them buy things like we go and buy things from them and come and sell it in our country. Let them not extract the raw material that has not been processed seven times. Okay, let's have the power of exportation. And I'll tell you what, you know, when my policy comes out, Ghana is going to find out that just our attributable reserves is in trillions, trillions. I am going to reveal all of this to Ghanaians. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are waiting for my intelligence, but I'm going to bring it because when I just keep saying everything on radio, before I know people are campaigning with it, okay? And those people are supposed to be the very experienced so-called whatever that is supposed to rule the country or lead the country or build the country. You see, it's very, very important that we accept that we're already in debt. But a debt that is accepted becomes credit. A debt that you run away from is a problem, okay? You'll be chased and, you know, the, the lender has got the borrow grabbed by his neck and deep into his soul. So we have gone and given ourselves to the Western world. They're definitely going to be pulling us. The day that we find our ways to create things from in within and create wealth and start extracting from them, that will be the reverse strategy. And the data will bring it. Thank you, Austin. Thank you. And it's great talking to you. Kali. Okay. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very Austin. much. I have about 20 more minutes and then I have to. Uh, okay, sure. I sure. Some more questions. Okay. So um, let's hear from Kobiche. Uh, good evening, Nana. 
Kobe, how are you? I'm good, sir. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Kali, for this opportunity. Uh, my focus will be on the um, Ghanaian children. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I think I sent a video of yeah. the, um, a documentary I did on some Ghanaian yeah. children who were sitting on the floor to learn. Most of yeah. them lack basic um, learning materials. And my question is, we often say that the future of every country is the children. Yes. What is your plan for Ghanaian children? Because guess what? I've had the opportunity to travel and every community you visit, there's children playground, the learning con condition for these children are amazing. 2024, children, education, children are still, and even up onto the senior high school level, some students still don't have tables and chairs to sit on to learn. What's mm -hmm. your plan for the Ghanaian child? Thank you. Thank you very much, Kobe. Um, myself, I feel the pain and I'm just like a Ghanaian child and I can understand the struggles that we're going through. See, first of all, the, the biggest problem we have as a country is that we don't have a budget to do anything. One. Two, we don't have city planning schemes, how we're building the cities, okay, to make sure that, you know, if there is factories here, jobs here, there is clinic, there is hospital and there's education. Okay, it's very scattered. Like people in the villages are trying to educate themselves. They're trying hard, but there isn't any governmental supporting system in place. And all of these things, it's budgetary. It's national budgetary. So if you see that when we talk about the 16 Industrial Revolution, we have captured this issue that you're talking about, Kobe. It's very important to us. But you see, if you go and build a, a school, in one of these villages because we think that they don't have a place to sit you build a school but if you just build a school or a hospital in less than two years the whole thing will run down because you need an integration system to support it that is the jobs that is the jobs so there is no circulation of any revenue so as and and i've been doing philanthropic work for a long time but when it comes to Africa, when you give, they are only sitting down waiting for you to come and give again because there is no way out. There is, no, there is not a system. There is nothing. And, and that's why we want to make sure that every region is de being developed. But before the region gets developed, again, I'm repeating myself that you need to get the stock, okay, the reserves, of that space and then you start to go into its potential developmental assets if it's farming we can't just do farming because uh we're going to plant uh, tomatoes but we can turn the tomatoes to tin tomatoes to tomatoes puri to tomatoes something something and something and many but this is what creates the jobs. This is what makes people respect education in this kind of area. So if you've noticed, most of the people that are going through this are people who are in outskirts of Accra. Maybe it's a bit difficult. It's still in Accra, but it's difficult. But then when you keep going to the villages, Kobe, it becomes worse. Because there's no plan, no structure for all of those areas. And the people are so used to every four years is their cocoa time to get money from someone and say, vote for me or do this for me. That's the only time they get money. And then they're not going to want to develop those areas because they just need the people for votes. Well, I don't think it's right for us to think like this in a country. And if we want to go forward and help all of these children, let's start to put the structures in place. There are so many talented Ghanaians, people who are going out there and not coming back home. They are giving it to the Western world. They are giving their best. How can we educate our children? And then when they turn 21, they go to America to go and do their best for someone else's organization and run away from their country and never want to come back because there is no system for them. Even though we claim that we have a democratic uh, platform that we have to govern our country with. You see, these are the things that wakes me up. And these are the things that wake me up. It makes me realize that I have a responsibility for this nation. What ha we have to do to help one another is not just to 
do some charitable stuff sometimes is good, but it runs down after some time if there's no system around it. So when I come, that's exactly what I'm going to do. You know, I'm going to make sure that there is system around it. And what I want to tell Ghanaians is that, you know, I have at least have this experience. They need to at least do their research and see that in the 21 years of my life being in Ghana and doing development and doing investment, I've had to manage people and all of these challenges and realize that, you know, even building wealth, you know, it has a different way of managing it and managing the people who are also creating the wealth for you and the people who have to manage the wealth for you and how you distribute things amongst them to be able to be stable in that industry. This is the same thing would happen. This the same thing will happen in the real world, in the national you know, uh, perspective, we would have to manage things that way. It's just that it's going to be more scalable on a bigger platform. And I think this is exactly what I would do. You know, I will make sure that I have that plan, you know, based on regions, and then it will come down to districts, constituencies, mm. development, and then let their returns help develop their regions. Thank you. Okay. I think that, that lastly, still on education, though, we, we uh -huh. are more focused on theory. How can we also change our, our education system so that we can also focus more on the practical values in uh, most of our institutions? I think I've started that already in my campaign, and I'm saying that, okay? But a lot of people might think that I don't support education. No, let me use this moment to correct that. I support education. However, a good education is when you understand what is around your surrounding and when you learn the things that is in your world, not the things in someone else's world, because you might not be needed there, okay? So that's the kind of education that will bring the practicality that you're talking about. We don't need to do the chew and pour anymore. We need practical education. We need to find out that the value of gold is what stabilizes our currency. So one day our president doesn't go or think that is best to use the gold to buy dollar <laughs> or to exchange gold for dollar when the gold itself is what holds the dollar that is what you know stabilizes uh, currency so if you learn about your gold you 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 grow up to become a potential entrepreneur or industrialist if you learn about your cocoa seed you would become an industrialist a farmer or something you know this education is important that if Ghanaians us to make sure that our people are being educated this way. You know, uh, we will grow up differently. You know, when you go to uh, the Chinese culture, you know, they train their children about stability. They train their children about industrialization. They train them about, you know, all different things. And guess what? They train them in Mandarin. Like, that's the language they speak. That's what they learn with, because they know that as long as they're in Asia, that's the language that they're going to speak. And that's how they need to understand themselves. So they grow up with confidence. They grow up with hope. They grow up with belief. When you come to Africa, you know, it's very different. And I agree with you. We need to change this uh, curriculum. We need to adjust it. We need to make it more suitable for our culture. And I think we'll get better results after that. Okay, Hans, let, let's hear Hans. Yes, um, Austin, Hans. can you hear me? Yeah, and respectfully to Hans and Nana, all those who be asking questions, we need to do it in like 30 seconds and short answers so that uh, we can get as many people because Nana has about, I think, 10 minutes more. Uh, Hans, let's hear you. Right, um, Austin, thank you very much. Now, um, I won an interview with you and Omar, Omar Sander where the question about education came up and I must say that I agree with your position on that. Education must not be the measure of your ability to lead a country, but what you cannot discount, however, is experience. And I'm talking about political experience here. Mm -hmm. Now, you point to your experience and successes as a businessman. Mm -hmm. But the fact also is that the principles of running a business that employs maybe 30,000 people will not um, be enough to manage 30 million plus people who exist in a space that is woefully underdeveloped with its attendant, you know, tribal, um, political, and religious underpinnings. Yes. There is, um, there are the, the local and international constitutional hurdles that you are going to have to deal with yeah. in, in, you know, the developmental agendas that you want to undertake. 
There is also the part about the about maneuvering the geopolitical space because mm -hmm. I mean Ghana doesn't exist on a different planet. Um, you are going to have to deal with global superpowers in a bid to see through even your industrialization agenda. Mm -hmm. All of these things require political experience. The fact is that you don't have those political experiences. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? Okay, thank you very much. I think that experience is the foundation of wisdom. And everybody needs to understand that you learn from experiences. Okay, so the reason why the politicians are supposed to do what they're supposed to do is because they have a cabinet around them. They have a ministerial cabinet around them. They have uh, a, a parliamentary platform around them. All of these people are already institutions that are organized. They're there to support, you know, you politicians. It, it, it's not a government, you know, it's a position. You're part of a government. You come and then you play your role and go. So whatever experience that you're supposed to have, I think that you need to to the political world. There is no such thing as a political experience that you go and get it from somewhere before you enter politics. The only thing that gives you the political experience that you're talking about is because you've been around politicians for a year, two or three or four. And then now you know ministers, you know the parliament and you know this and you know that and you know the basic national law. That is the experience. And anyone that gets into a real world learns from the real world just like how you might have left education and started your business now you understand business if you started cleaning business you understand cleaning very well you will know all the chemicals you know what to do with the business if you started uh, as a political uh, uh, worker you know as your intention you probably if from ministry of trade maybe down you know about industrialization you will know about things so for me to have come up that this is what I want to do. It means I am ready to, first of all, learn. Secondly, I am ready to work with people that also understand the field. So I'm not saying that I'm the very wise one or the very smart one to do this alone. I can't do it alone. I need to do it with people who also understand, you know, this field. And I need to add what I have to this. And we need to move together and make that change because there are people who have the experience that have been in this for 40 years. Some have been in there for 30 years, 20 years, and they still haven't been able to do it any different. It's just the same. In fact, it's going backwards. So I just believe that, you know, not to say that I'm going to use my business agreements to govern this country, but I believe that is going to be part of it. That experience is going to be part of what I know. And I'm yet to find out more about the political world and add it to that. And then the, thing, the third one about you talking about international uh, platforms that I have to deal with and everything. Look, my policy is simple. I think that the biggest tragedy that befells on African politics is foreign influence. I just want to change the power of foreign influence simply and make it international commercial relationship. I don't want any backdoor discussions as foreign influence. We don't want any people coming in blue, blue suits and white shirts and red ties, and then they come and enter our offices and before you know, they say a concession of maybe lithium or gold that is worth uh, 30 or 80 billion, which can pay our whole debt that we have as a nation is being sold to China or America. We just want international commercial. Whatever Americans want to say, they're welcome to say it. England wants to say they're welcome, but they have to buy from us. They have to buy oil from us, but they can buy also refined oil from us. Okay, so we don't have to go and buy a refined oil from them after they took the crude from us. That's the relationship that I want. And that is, for me, my solution to deal but, with them. But my you. question, my question really is that, for instance, for oil, you don't set the price. The price is set by somebody sitting elsewhere. Even though the commodity is yours, you are selling at a price that is determined for you. You know, mm -hmm. in trade, there are various treaties that Ghana has signed on to that put, you know, certain... Mm -hmm. But, to, 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 okay, but to, to, to answer your question again, 
does Ghana even have a refinery? It's just the Chinese people that came to build it. So we are not worried about whether certain prices or not. We're just we're just more interested in giving the whole thing to someone and taking 10 percent. That is the so-called experienced politicians that you're talking about. And I think that it's about time that we, the youth, get our minds right. If we understand numbers, we should read into the numbers and we should understand that that 10 percent and the 90 percent that is going somewhere, that is the one that creates the job. That is the one that creates the wealth, but it's being given away. So I don't really think that we need to use experienced politicians right now to talk about setting prices of oils and all of that. It's about dealing with the reality of our situation. We don't want to industrialize anything. The current refinery in this country, it's for Chinese. We have left our one, closed our one, and now we've made Chinese people come and build a refinery so they can sell us fuel that we're paying 2000 for it. This is a very, very intelligent, smart, experienced politicians that they're in Ghana and doing this. You see, this is why the white people laugh at us, because we act like we're not thinking about these things. You have the product, you have the, the, the raw material, you have the platform, you have even started your own refinery. Instead of expanding it, you're closing it for an outsider to come and build it. And that outsider even bring his own workers in here. And this is what we, the youth, want to support as experience. Please. Okay. I, I don't. I, I don't agree with some of the things, but um, uh, we yeah, must no set our own prices soon. Kali, who is the next person? Okay, we are the Kofi and Tim. We'll, we'll pick just two or three, then Anna, you can Thank go you. back to Kofi and Tim. Please make your questions short. Kofi is not ready. You All are. Right, let's move on to your next one. Okay, uh, they're great. They're great. Let's hear. Yeah, it. yeah. Thanks, Kali, and thanks, Anna, for being here. Um, I have a quick question. I I want to know. Do you have um an idea of who your running mate is going to be, and also? who your cabinet members are going to be? Yes, I do. I, I do have an idea at least who my running mates could be. I have a few in mind, but uh, I, I still want to look. I could choose anyone from any of the regions. It doesn't necessarily have to be a fully educated, enlightened person from Accra who is already in the political industry. But I feel like if someone has great mind in development and wants to change either the origin and more regions that were more aligned, you know, that person could be chosen. As for the cabinet, I can't really be ready that I've picked all the members for cabinet and everything. I think that, you know, sometimes in life, you wait to get to a stage and things fall in place itself. So there are some people that I have listed, but I also think that there are some people that will come up straight away, you know, when things fall in place or when we get to the top. Thank you. Okay, and you take Ganyobi, and you take Ganyobi, you will be our last but one, and we would have a lady who would end for us. And you take Ganyobi, goddess. please be quick. Is, is it goddess? Is goddess yeah. trying to ask? Okay. Yeah, and you, uh, oh, okay, Anyete is gone. So, uh, Anyete, Anyete, please, Anyete Ganyobi. Hello, good evening to everyone. Us, goddess, let's hear you. Oh, okay, Anyete, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Um, goddess, Hi, good evening to everyone. So, um, good evening, my, good evening. Good evening. Yes, yeah, so my question comes in two folds. I first of all want to touch on the the constitution. You know, the constitution is actually one of the major reasons why um, we see politic uh, politicians um, apply their corruption path and go scot free. So I want to know how um, NKB plans on um, touching on the constitution because we already have. Um, old or we have a uh, previous people asking for the constitution to be amended because when you look at the even the u.s for instance we see the 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 um the constitution going um against the the president because we see certain things the um, president is doing now breaking some of the laws of the constitution yeah. and then there's no one or there's nothing yeah. being done about it so i want to know the plans nkb has um, towards the constitution and then secondly i that's my second question is on the national development plan you know for every country to actually be built you need a plan that is something kwame Nkrumah started i want to know um the plans um, nkb has for the country i want to know if 
the, the 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 previous plans of the country is what is going to follow because we knew well we know Kwame Nkrumah started something and then um, uh, let's see um, okay. presidents in president now no one has been able to actually follow through on that particular plan so I want to know um, NKB's um, plan towards that as well thank you thank you thank you very much so um, I, I will start with the first one I think that you know, our constitution is way overdue for reviewing. <laughs> you know, it needs to be reviewed. And I think, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think the last time was maybe 1992 or something. Um, you know, so this is something that we need to consider reviewing it, not changing it, but slowly adjusting it because, you know, change is a process. And when you do it straight away, it brings a shock, which is not good for, you know, humanitarian em 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 environment. Okay, so definitely it's in my interest. And to correct some things, and also uh, as, as a leader, I would like the nation to support me to empower the government properly, you know. So, so the, the, their decisions are respected and people that are in those positions are also accountable. You know, and, and, and that will give you that American or European vibe that you're talking about. Um, the second one, and um, I, I'm thinking that you talking about Kwame Nkrumah is great, you know, for me to be able to answer this question properly. Yes, I have a 10-year plan for Ghana. And that master plan, I think very soon, sooner or later, it will be revealed you know, um, and how, you know, it's going to change Ghana and transform Ghana and make us become the hub of the continent. Okay, now, why is it 10 years? It's because if Ghanaians like the first four years, that change that it will bring, that creation of wealth, that job creation, that happiness, that economic boost and economic prosperity that will bring a great balance in the national governance, then I must say that even if it was four years that I started, somebody needs to continue the other four and somebody needs to finish it on a 10th year plan. And I think this is what we need to do. We should not let anybody lie to us that, you know, we have a developmental agenda and it's 2070 or 2060. You know, the reason why I'm saying that is because, you know, even in life, nobody plans to their 70. You know, you plan your five years and then you exit your 10 years. OK, I'm going to go to do my GCSEs and then after you do your O levels, uh, uh, sorry, A levels, and then you go to university and then, you know, five years and I'm going to do law. And then after law, I'm going to get a job. Nobody plans for 70 years. You plan for the next 10 years as exiting or the next five years as, you know, establishing something. So I have, I have an exit plan that in 10 years, you know, maybe this amount of jobs needs to be created, this amount of entrepreneurs, this amount of leaders, this amount of, you know, uh, new counselors, all of that, it's within the plan. And I think that's what Kwame Nkrumah started also. Uh, every great leader should be a great planner. And every great planner should respect time because time, is what they're either going to pay for or create wealth out of. And your planning falls within that. And so my time is very precious to me and is now. And new force, we have arrived. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Goddess, you are the only lady. Ask the last question and I will leave. Then because um, others would be here, we can continue after he leaves. Goddess, let's hear you. Thank you so much. Um, first off, I just want to say uh, thank you for making yourself a like very accessible for folks to speak with you. Um, that's dope. But um, I'm not really buying much of what you said. Of the working class. Um, Dreams and mm -hmm. hope does absolutely nothing from the working class. Um, I want a budget. And just as Plan you're breaking. Is, you're breaking, Goddess. You you need your internet. You're breaking. Can you guys hear her? Yeah, I think she's breaking from my end. To Goddess, can you reposition yourself respectfully because you keep breaking up as you. Is speak. it better now? I yeah, think it is. Thank you. Thank you. It was probably my Wi-Fi. 
Okay. So I was saying. And you are panting. You are panting. Are you okay? Is everything okay with you? How about let's focus on my questions and how I'm sounding. I would okay. really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so I was saying, hopes and dreams does absolutely nothing for the working class. Just as the person ahead of me spoke, a development plan is must needed for every person to have access to, to see what your plans look like. So with the development plan, can we see a budget and how are you going to make it accessible for folks to look through each policy that you are going to try to implement um, and so that Ghanaians can understand thoroughly what type of policies you want to integrate into the Ghanaian society to see if this is actually going to benefit the working class. So that's my question to you. Thank you. Um, how are you going to Thank make you. your budget and the development plan accessible with clear cut policies for people to understand? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So first of all, a development plan can come in 10 years. OK, there is something called feasibility for your plan. But you have to remember, whatever prices that is put on that feasibility changes almost every year or two, depending on the currency stab stabilization in your country, especially with Ghana having currency fluctuations. Um, so you can't be guaranteed with a specific budget that will last you for 10 years. But to answer your question, I did say just before you asked the question that I already have a 10-year plan that would be uh, released very okay, soon. So to this is I, to cut you I, off. I think I'm answering your question. If you can just. No, but I, I wanted and... to just confirm something. I, the development plan being 10 years makes absolutely no sense as we're voting for you for four. So. No, I, but, but you didn't listen I, to me. If you I were did. I heard everything please. you said. And, and, and can you calm down and then just. I'm very let calm. You ask the question. I'm very calm. But then let me answer. So okay. The, if you will let yeah, me Yeah, the answer. development plan being within your four year turner no, no, goddess, and the goddess, budget. Goddess please, please, goddess, please hold on and let me moderate okay. this. I think that what Nana is saying is you've asked the question. Question. And he's, and certain, he's setting the premise and setting a uh, certain uh, laying the foundation so he can answer you properly. When he's done, then you can come in respectfully. So, Nana, let's hear you. Okay. So. Uh, as, as God, as you were saying that, you know, uh, if I'm going to be here for four years, then why do I plan for 10 years? Just as why I did the 10 years, because I think that as a country, when everybody comes to power in four years or eight years, they don't follow the plan of the country. They follow their own plan as a politician. So they stop everything that was being done before and they start all over again. We need the new force. We don't want that. We want to be able to continue with the country's vision, agenda. If it's working, then why should we cancel it and start all over again? Just because I'm from this party or I'm from this party. Again, I'm trying to say that planning for a nation has nothing to do with a party's interest. It's got to do with the country's interest. So if we have a plan for a country for the next 10 years, it means that these plans could be how we want to build our railways based on what we have as reserves for our steel. That's one. How we want to build our water connections or water bodies for transportation is based on the rivers that is around and how we want to connect them and use them for irrigations. So all of these plans comes with the budget. That investment would not just be locally. It would also be international people that will become a part of this development. How to source those people and negotiate with them is important. Now, if you look at some of the greatest developments in Ghana, they were not done by us going to take loan from outside to build. They were based on negotiations. And one of them is the Vota Lake. The Vota Lake was negotiated by Kwame Nkrumah. And part of it was the minerals of this country, but it, he was giving them 50% and the other 50% was supposed to be processed here. But part of that mineral was put into the structure of negotiating for the people that will build the lake. And that lake became one of the biggest man-made lake in the country. So it, this budgetary that you're talking about, there's so many things that you can negotiate with that could help us reach that. And there could be also IRR where, you know, or ARR, you know, return of your investment where other people might like, you know, whether it's BOT, whatever that it is that we will negotiate. But it's the, the, the main thing is about us developing our country and building our nation. And if we have any plan that will make us better from what we are now, I don't think any word like it doesn't make sense. 
should stop it from happening because it might not make sense to someone, but it might benefit someone. Thank okay. you. Thank you. And, and I would like to apologize for um, uh, if anything came up that did not go. No, it's fine. It's yeah. fine. I mean, people, people are people, um, you know, and sometimes you just need to understand that it's not everyone that would understand where you're coming from. But, you know, the end always justify the means. Some people might not um, respect you in the beginning, but respect is earned. It's not claimed. Okay. So, but, however but, I earn yeah. it, it's, it's Thank fine. You. Thank and you. Goddess, Goddess, this is not a, an attack on um, your line of questioning, but I think that the choice of words has not come across as very right. Uh, because if uh, uh, a revered person like him, who is aspiring to the highest office in the land, answers a question, for you to have said that his response doesn't make sense, I think that it was wrong. Um, it did not come out well. My thinking is you wanted to use a, a certain uh, diction or words, choice of words, but then it doesn't make sense, just came out of the blue. So that is why I'm saying that. But Nana, thank you for also accepting no, it's that. It's fine. It's okay. fine. So Nana, it's um, fine. I, think... I, I just want to say this in addition that, yeah. you know, since I started uh, this, I have had a lot of people with different insults and all of that, but I don't respond to people. And it's not because I'm not the type that don't want to respond, but my way of responding is making sure that one day the same words that have come out of people's mouth would end up choking them. Because once you get what you're supposed to do, once you get it done, people benefit from it and it, it brings an impact. And that's what we're looking for. So I just want the people out there who are also, you know, are some kind of agent or whatever that you're doing, I, I, I am mad at you. <laughs> you know, okay. I just understand that, you know, some people have to be like that. But let, let the concentration be on this vision, where we are going. Let us all come together and make sure that we change the space, you know. Uh, and I, and I, 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 I'm very grateful eh, for this platform, you know, having this discussion. And it's really the first time, you know, I've had a long discussion with you. You're, you're a great guy. Very Thank plain you. and very neutral. Thank you. So, <laughs> Thank yeah. You. I okay, think I have not... a few more questions with you to wrap it up. There were a few yeah. things that would, we didn't would discuss. Would you want to pick uh, two more um, people from uh, the listeners? Or, I, I, I would like us to deal with a few more questions because I think there are a few things that we haven't talked about, you know, like, you know, the petition and other things that, you know, I think the nation needs to, you know, be very much aware of. So maybe those okay. questions okay, are, so are Let's important. do five. Let's do five, if that's okay by you. Well, well, from your side, I think that I, I am okay for us to go through that. You know, um, a lot of the questions now is it's becoming budgetary and a lot of things. But those things will happen when I'm in power. Do you understand yeah. what I'm saying? It's, yeah. yeah. It's right yeah. now, it's 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 not the right time for me to be pre-judgmental or pre uh, having a pre prerequisition of what I am exact what exactly I'm going to do when I'm there in terms of budget. But the vision of getting there, the vision and the discussion of how we can correct things and manage things and be able to come in a space of leadership in terms of our generational achievement. I think that's what I'm here. For. Okay. So okay. So I'll do five. Then I would ask the last question so that sure. uh, you, Kofi and team, you are back. Um, I think you had issues with your. Uh, right. feet. Let's. I'll go. make this one quick. So I wanted to ask, um, Mr. Bidia, do you have any plans to have people run as MPs? And if you don't, how do you plan to run the country without having parliamentary representation? Because you need the the approval to pass laws and run certain things. Yes, thank you very much, Kofinti. So the constitution tells you that you need parliamentary uh, members to be able to become a leader of the country. That's fine. We're not worried about that. But the same constitution is telling you that if I am running for an independent president now, um, I don't need the 12 people, or I don't need the 30 people, but I can stand for independence. When that happens, there could be a lot of independent people that are also winning. They can all, we can all come together as a coalition. But I'll tell you what will happen if I decided to concentrate on having independent candidate because I think I'm going to become a president and therefore I will need those people. They would distract my attention and my focus. And they will split my budget 
of campaigning for this because I want to gain five or ten people to enter the parliamentary. That I will not do. I think the first thing is, first of all, getting on the ballots because, you know, when we put in the right information to have a political party, we were not rejected, but we were not responded to. You know, it's taking a lot of months, and that's why we're going with the independent. So why don't we concentrate on how we can use the independent to at least get somewhere? You know, if the people of this country or the nation decides to vote for new force, a new force either surpasses whatever percentage that puts us in the industry, in the political world, then we can take other decisions from there as how the parliamentary members will come or the MPs will come. I think that will happen, you know. Okay. Nana, Nana, um, Nana, I think that to reposition his question well, there's mm -hmm. no law that bars you from contesting or saying that once you win, you have to have MPs. There is nothing like that. But there's a law that says that 50% uh, mm -hmm. plus of your ministers should come from parliament. Mm -hmm. And he's saying that looking at our recent past and elections, mm -hmm. the NBC and MPP have managed to even dwarf the CPP and PNC who had representation in parliament. So you would likely have to choose them. Your, your ideas is at, is at pari passu with them. How are you going to choose them? Because that would be a legal requirement. You have to choose 50% plus of your ministers from parliament mm -hmm. that is i think to reframe his question that is that is what so, you wanted so, to ask how will you so do, do you need to choose them before you stand for the independent candidates no 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 that's why i've retreated you don't. exactly said, when you win because he believes you will so win. once i win these things come together you see the point that i'm trying to make here is that when you want to build a house and you know that you're going to get to the roof and you're going to need all the ceilings and all the wiring and everything. Yes, you cannot finish building the house without these things. But it doesn't mean that you should buy all of them and put it down. Okay, you need to get to a stage. When you get to the stage, you will see that the planning folds in. So there would be a choosing moment once there is a winning moment. But if you don't start the house at all and you don't build the foundation to put the structure and you're so worried about the wiring and the plasterboard that will go in there, you might waste all your uh, investment before you even put the structure. You'll be stuck. Okay, Nana, Nana, respectfully, respectfully. Mm -hmm. You see, if we had the Vice President Baumia or former President John Mahama in this mm -hmm. space, we would be speaking to them as we believe either of them can be president January 7, 2025. Mm -hmm. So what Kopi is saying is he wants to accord you the same respect mm -hmm. so he doesn't speak to you as somebody who is just running but believes you will win and also become president. Mm -hmm. And he's saying that you are president 2025. He believes that. But the law says that you need to pick 50% plus of your ministers from parliament. And if it is NDC and MPP who would be majority, have more MPs in parliament. Uh, you would have to pick them. Are you willing to pick them whilst their ideologies are variance with yours? That, that is his question. No. He believes you will win. No, I think that we should also respect the fact that the parliament is a parliament. These are existing MPs that have won seats in the parliament. Okay, it's like just going to England, the, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. The House of Commons are representing just, you know, political uh, um, sort of vision in the country. And, they, they, you know, they're all going to be there debating with each other, you know, in making sure that their plans are right. So... I think that there could be a coalition of NDC and MPP, some of these people coming together and even forming for the sake of this country being built properly. The time has come that we make our minds up. So that parliament, that choosing and choosing and all of these people, I think when it gets to that point, that's what I'm saying. I don't necessarily have to sit here and say that, oh, I don't agree with them, so I, I'm going to what? Move all of them and replace them? No. I think that it's not about agreeing with people. It's about knowing 
what people can do with situations, you know, because everybody counts and everybody has a purpose of being here. It's just that if you have a leader and maybe their decisions is not aligned with your potential, then there could be a change. But there's so many ways to merge or to unify people together and still get the best out of them. It would take us a long time to overhaul our parliament. Okay. Um, Dr. Jima, let's hear you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Kali Austin, thank you for the opportunity. Um, Mr. Bidiakum, also thank you for the opportunity. But I want to ask, my question is about political parts. I mean, your campaign financing. And mm -hmm. if you have an, uh, an idea how much it's going to cost you to run a successful presidential campaign, and how is that going to be funded? Because I believe that that is the beginning of the problems we have in this country. Thank you. Okay. So first of all, I mean, if I have a campaign to, to, to do in this country and I have to create a budget for, I can't come to the public and say, hey, give me $100 million because... I have a campaign and this is what it's going to cost me. The public probably will not be able to raise that money for me. And if I'm the one that is going to be responsible to do so also, I think that I don't own the answer to the public as how I'm going to put that money together. And it's exactly this money. These sort of discussions, I think that I've had a few people ask me these questions on, on radio and all of that. And I did answer them by telling them that why did they not have the guts to go and ask the existing politicians who came in with a constitution that declared them as people that didn't have money or businesses or this wealth to do campaign. So why is it that I have started a movement and then people are asking me these questions about my finance and the cost and how much is your billboard going to cost and all of that. Personally, I think that it's not part of a developmental question and a greater plan as we're here to discuss. You know, if it's budgets, I think that I will find different people to have that discussions with. People who have either some sort of financial district, you know, accessibility that we can have that discussion as in, okay, this could be the contribution or this can be that, or people who genuinely want to contribute to what I'm doing can have this discussion. But I would not bring a feasibility of exactly what it's gonna cost me to do my campaign now. Thank you very much. Kali J, okay. you have some things. I'm seeing my uncle on here, Citizen Coffee. What a legend. I am so grateful that you're listening to us. Um, you are my uncle. You are someone that, you know, have inspired me, you know, in the past, the present, and still be inspiring me in future. Um, I, I don't know, uncle, if you're going to ask me a question, but um, I'm here. I just saw you. Can yes. You? Yes. Nana, I see you too. <laughs> and uh, you are making a lot of sense. If this is the time for me to speak to the audience... Uh, let me say that uh, first, thank the organizers, uh, Kali J, Brother Austin. Um, this is an epochal moment in the history of our country where, by technology, a person like Nana Kwan Bidiakon has been courageous and bold to say, yes, I want to run for president. I want to help redeem my country. And then through this platform, exchanges can take place so they can be understood. Let me also thank all of you who are attending to listen. It is, it is a show of interest in your nation that you feel that something is amiss, something is not going well. Your personal life is not going well. Your community life is not going well. So let me also get in, get involved, listen, and have some questions answered for me. Let us all get involved. A nation cannot be built by one person. A nation cannot be built by 10 people. But a nation is a collective of the citizens of that nation. And if a young man, Larana Bidiakon, stands up and says, nation, listen to me. I am here to dedicate my life 
everything that I've learned, my wisdom, to join other people and help redeem the nation. We must listen to that. And I think this process is what is happening. Uh, Kaliji tells me that uh, later on he would like to talk to all the presidential candidates. I think that it would be a measure in the right direction. The exchange to hear from the voice of the people who are to lead us, not just through uh, this and that, this and that, and tribal connections and all of that, we select a leader and then later on we are disappointed. We need to know the thinking of the people who want to lead us. And you have heard from Nana Kwambidiako, his thinking. He wants to do industrialization. He wants a relationship with the international community based on commerce. And these are intelligent things that we, we might be discussing. And I think we should applaud him for that. But as time goes on, the bottom line is going to be for Ghana to stand up and to become a nation that is progressing, we need to learn to use the resources that the good God has given us. And when I say resources, number one, the people, the 30 to 35 million people is an asset. And if we learn how to give them the right good paying jobs, then we'll be going somewhere. We need to learn to use the land that the good God has given us. The 91,000 square miles of land is a huge asset. And land reform in Ghana must be paramount in, in, in all our head. Because if you have an asset, it's not, it's not usable because of the way that it's held. Is not going to help you. And we need, as Nana Kwambidiakon said, we need to know how to exchange the minerals that God is giving us in the commercial sense to help us, not to give them away. Sell our minerals for patents, turn around and buy things from the international market for exorbitant prices. That if you have oil, learn how to refine it. By the refining process, you are creating good jobs for your people. And good jobs means that money is in the pockets of individuals and through their buying and selling and activities on a daily basis, the economy will be expanding. So, Nana, thank you for taking the time to come and talk thank to you. the young Ghanaians. Uh, Kali J and Brother Austin, thank you for hosting this. At another time, I would like to be able to also come and talk to all of you. But but people like Nana Kwan Bidia, yeah, you can criticize and all of that. That's part of politics. But I think the, the, the positive part of it must also be recognized. But regardless of my weaknesses in life, I want to come forward and dedicate myself to say, let's join hands and redeem our country. And that's where we are. We are at a redemption state in the affairs of Ghana. No, don't let anybody dissuade you. You can have your own party affiliation. That's fine. But be realistic with yourself. Are things really going well for Ghana since independence? Are they really going well? The nations that we started with, the Singapore's and the, and the Malaysia's and the South Korea's have gone and left us down there. Why is that? These are the questions we must be agitating our minds. Why are we down there and our classmates of colonialism have gotten up eh, and weighed $60,000 per capita income for their citizens and we are down there $2,000, $3,000 per capita income? So there's something that we are not doing right. And uh, the, 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 the Kwan Bidi Akuns of this world uh, are standing up and saying, young people, if our fathers have made a mistake, we cannot continue to go in the same direction. We might be able to change it and, and add something to it so that in 10 years' time, Ghana will be somewhere. So thank you very much, Nana. Thank you for thank allowing you. me Thank to you, speak. Doctor. Thank then, you. And, uh, I, I wish all of you okay. the best of luck. And, and, and this presidential campaign period, please, Take it seriously. Ask the tough questions and make the right decisions for the redemption of Ghana. Thank you. God bless you. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And there are plans to host uh, Citizen Kofi, but I think that he just let the cat out of the bag. So no problem. <laughs> uh, I'll talk more about him. And, 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 and I hope and, when, when they host me, you will also attend. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, I will be yes, the will. And I, I will tell them about the infamous 1992 Kwame Bidiakon of that yeah. year. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nana, your last words before uh, um, you leave, and uh, we would continue to have a discussion, but your last okay. words before Okay, you so leave, there, because... there were some things that were not discussed, and one of them was the petition. Now, the petition okay. that I filed was not because 
I think I'm too big to stand up against the EC and then instruct them as in what to do right. But I just thought that it was time for us to claim the human rights in this country, especially the democratic right of an average Ghanaian. Now, let's just look at people who have turned 18 today or tomorrow, and they don't get the chance to educate yourselves about democracy. Uh, democratic uh, um, um, governance. And then from 18 to 21 or 22, because it's going to take them another four years before they get a chance to vote. That is if they're registered then. But the question is, would they even be in Ghana? Or would they still be that same person? Because they could, they would be out of the country, or they might not even want to come back to their country, or they might have become a man already from 18 to 22. So we not giving the chance or depriving the youth of this country from educating them and giving them the chance for their right to vote. I think it's something that we should take it very serious. You know, um, you're looking at people who turned 18 this year from June, July, August, September, October, November, America, Europe, all these places, China, that we're buying things from them, they would never do this to their children. And I'm not saying that the EC is bad for doing that, but I'm saying also that if the constitution is there and the law is there, why don't we give the chance to the people? Why are we depriving them? And it's something that is very important. I think that the nation didn't speak to it. They didn't stand up to it because it's very important that we don't lose this youth. We're losing all our youth to the Western world because by the time they're 20-something, they don't think that they have to come back to their country. And even if they didn't leave their country and we let them turn 23 or 24 before we give them this chance, I don't think that is the same youth that you're talking about. He, already, he would have already been out there hustling, you know, thinking, having a different perception for this world. So this is the moment for us to make that change. And I'm using this platform to politely urge the EC to consider, you know, giving this youth the chance to be a part of this 2024 election. You know, uh, from June, July, August, September, and we should all stand for that. We should give these youth the chance. We should not let them keep pushing them forward till they become 22 because it's affecting us. And some people don't just, they don't care to vote anymore. The reason why we have a lot of floating voters is because we got them to register at the wrong time. We tried to educate them about democracy at a time when we thought we needed them the most or we wanted to pay them for them to vote. And as long as we tolerate this, our national governments will be facing these issues that we're facing today. It's one of the major things that I think we, as the new force and as the nation and, and as the young generation of this country, we should stand up for. Even if we're not able to get as many as to be educated and we get a few or we get a couple of millions or thousands, it starts from here. And I can see a brighter future, you know, in Ghana. And I think that this is something that we need to do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And um, Anna, before you go, before yeah. you go, I think that the Constitution says that the Electoral Commission should register people who are 18 and above and of sound mind mm -hmm. to partake in elections. Mm -hmm. So the Electoral Commission since 1992 mm -hmm. has been setting a date for limited registration and also uh, other forms of registration. Mm -hmm. But someone went to court and the Supreme Court has ruled that the Electoral Commission should do continuous registration. That continuous registration is what Nana is talking mm -hmm. about. The Electoral Commission is saying that they face logistical challenges. And the NDC and MPP, who are the two biggest parties, disagree and agree with the Electoral Commission because they want their agents, because of trust issues, they want their agents to be there every day through the 365 days that the uh, Supreme Court has ruled on. So what Nana Kwame Bidi Akon is saying is, he believes that when it is election year, at a point we need to stop the uh, registration, but believes it should go to like 
September and after election year, the continuous registration that the Supreme Court has ruled on should continue. So he is saying if we believe in democracy, we should all be urging the EC to do what he's saying with continuous registration. Because, for instance, like Rupal, those who are outside Ghana, the court has also ruled that they should be registered and they should be given the opportunity to vote. The EC is also saying about constr constraints, logistical constraints, which is going against their fundamental human rights and also the court ruling on Rupal. So that is what Nana is saying when he says he, he wants us to all clamor and join what he is bringing that the EC should do it. So I, I wanted to make that clear because some didn't know. Thank you. We should have talked about it extensively, but because of time and other questions, we couldn't deal with that. That I agree with because laws are laws. If a law is passed, go and do it. This logistical country, because it's been like seven years since the court ruled on mm -hmm. this. Rupal has been more than seven years. It is unfair. And I think that Nana, form some, we would join. I would join because it is the law. The court has ruled. The EC should find ways with political parties to do it. I, I just want to thank you to very much, Austin. We comment. all have to do this together. And, and thank you for, for giving them, you know, even a better explanation. Thank you. I think you should be a spokesperson too, by the way. Um, <laughs> that's a joke, but you spoke very well about that. Um, I think clearly, hands down, if we have continuous uh, registration from June to December, it's likely that we're going to win hands down. And the country knows this. The politicians know this. The, the people obviously know that. There is over maybe 2 million young people who don't want to register or who are looking forward to register. But, you know, they are not given that full time because the only time they had was 20 days, not even three weeks, 20 days. That's a restriction. You know, that's a deprivatization. Dep and I think uh, what you're saying, if we can all come together at any time, I'm ready for that help. Um, on that note, uh, Kali, if you have one last question for me, I will take it. But if not, I would. Okay. Well, I think I think we've exhausted most of our questions, and um, the space has been very very successful. We had uh, like um, two thousand people here, two thousand live listeners. Um, I think. We had like we we still have over fifty eight requests, so I think we have to probably do a part two of this piece so that we can get enough questions. But I I think it has been all today has been successful. You we were able to bridge the gap. Um, the youth were also able to um channel their questions and their opinions through. Thank you. I've been I've been going through the hashtag and I realized that a lot of people still have questions. I um they have questions that I think. We, we need to reschedule like we have to have a part two of this space hopefully yeah. at a better time and 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 run it yeah through. so just to add i will have a questionnaire platform coming very soon from the new force and an app you know so because i want to be able to interact with people i want to introduce ai the things that you know we can have a lot of answers for the ghanaian youth because i can also see that they do have questions and most of the questions are very tangible and uh, needs to be answered so they get a clear space in their minds as where they're going and what is a movement and how it can change the redemption uh, or redemptive revolution that doctor was talking about that we need as a country before we can move to a next stage we're going into a golden age moment and we definitely need to give the youth the chance to become the foundation of the developmental plans of this country because they represent the future and they're the ones that have the future in them. We have at least leave half of our future already, most of us, and we have half left and we're going to sleep a third of that away too. So it's not much time on our side, but the people coming, we need to set up this foundation for them. And then when we're not there, we will be remembered, plus our absence will be felt for what we did in their favor. And on that note, I really want to use this moment to thank Ghanaians that, you know, since I started this movement, you know, they've made me realize that the same people that I stood and put my neck on the line for are the same people that are following the movement. They have uplifted it. They have made it become a life and is present. And we are here. We have arrived. I couldn't say 
just thank you. But I just also want to wish you guys a great future together. You know, I know it's difficult times, but sometimes we need to go through difficult times to enjoy the value of time and to know what money is worth. We're going to work for it, but at this very point, we're bringing our heads together and make a change, the change that we want. And I'm glad to know that it's taking you and me together to be able to do this. I really appreciate all of you. I want to thank you, Kali J. I want to thank you, Austin. I want to thank you, Dr. Citizen Kofi, for those great words of mentorship. And I want to thank all the youth, the questions that were asked and everything, you know, uh, and being a part of this, taking your time to be here and listen to me. It's very much appreciated. God bless Ghana and God bless the people of Ghana. I wish you all well. Love you all and stay strong. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Good evening, everyone. Oh, we can hear you. Let's hear you. All right. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, Austin, please, I, I would need clarification on this. When um, Nana was asked how he will resolve corruption issues, all I could hear was, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but all I could hear was it's a value problem, so when we increase the salaries that people are getting, um, they wouldn't be corrupt, that kind of thing. But I didn't hear in, I didn't hear anything from him with regards to punishing the act of corruption. Because if, if I can remember clearly, in this country that we are, some of the people that are well paid in government are the people who are engaged in corruption. So how? Because if you do not punish people and you are still paying them, um, human nature, we are greedy by nature. So even if you do not punish them and you think the best way to solve it is to increase their salaries, how do we really move forward from there? Because if you could just increase salaries, everyone would do that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And that is a problem I have. You see, I asked that question first. And people think that when you are host or asking questions, you just ask, what would you do? Will you appoint? No, 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 no. It was leading up to what you are just saying. Because the attorney general, you know, I raised it. The attorney general is the one who would prosecute criminal offenses. The, I asked him, I think that his answers, I was not, but because of time, but because he's not here, I don't want us, um, I don't want to be speaking when he's not here to defend himself. Uh, could, you, could you, our next speaker, let's hear you, sir. Um, good evening. Thank you for this opportunity. Honestly, um, I joined very late. I set an alert, but probably got distracted. But uh, all I want to say is that um, it's just about time that we as Ghanaian youth, we give um, a very young person the chance to lead us. Uh, we've seen the, we've literally relayed our baton between two political parties, the New Patriotic and the National Democratic Congress. And to be honest, we've seen what they can offer. We've had MPP take us through a ten of years. We've had NDC take us through a ten of years. And it's like all the time we just keep going in circles with these two parties. And it, stand, it stands from like a, more like a cultural type of a thing. It's become something that when, when you're born, uh, your parents are already affiliated to a political party. So therefore, you're automatically aligned it's like a religion now. And I think that we as youth must must start really eradicating that mentality. We should really base our support for a candidate based on policies than just mere um, affiliations or mere sentiments, mere decisions that had been passed on from us subconsciously without our own uh, 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 independent judgment. And I think that <clears throat> what um, Nana Kwan Bidiako is doing or the step that he is taking is one of the boldest that I've seen any person within that age range has ever done regardless of if he's going to win or not it doesn't even matter but the mere fact that we have an independent person wake up to the cause and say look i have my own resources i have played my part i have worked and i want to lead the youth you know it doesn't really matter what his track record or what he's done or the mere fact that he's still within the age range of 40 43 or something and then it's like i want to run for presidency, I want to lead the nation. You know, that's a big cause. That opens door for us. That also sets pace for the rest of the generations to also know that it's about time we wake up, right? I was quite recently reading the 
the the um, biography of the Senegal youngest president, and you can see what this man is doing. It's like a surprise. It hit the whole continent by surprise that, wow, so the people actually willingly voted for that much of a young person to lead them to be their president. Why not us? It's just about time we also reform our mind to take up that course. And I think that it doesn't really matter for me, like I'm saying, whether uh, what policy MPP has or what policy and is a world record or this. I'd rather appreciate that we we rally much, much of our support to a new force, to a new person to lead us, to, to, to literally pave the way, especially for somebody who has done extremely well entrepreneur-wise, right? Then we just, like I said, continue in the path of uh, our parents and uh, uh, um, just continue the same unnecessary values. Anyway, I'll end it here. Thank you for the opportunity for meeting me. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, you are next speaker. Let's be quick with it in, within a minute. Yeah. Hello, yeah. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, um, you are our next speaker. If you can hear me, then Roma Empire, let's hear you. Hello, Roman Empire. Akwesi, let's hear you. Akwesi, Austin, let's hear you. Austin, thank you very much. And um, it was really an insightful space. And good news to you and Kaliji for a wonderful job. I knew that for you, you'll be asking the very critical and sensible questions. And I wasn't surprised that, you know, most of the questions you've asked, I was expecting some, you know, concise and, you know, probably some in-depth answers from, you know, Jacob Caesar. But unfortunately, you know, he was beating about the bush. For me, that's how I saw it. He was beating about the bush. And he seems to be answering every question with industrialization and all that. So for me, if he was probably here, one of the things I would advise him to do is probably, you know, yes, this is a very good step for him to actually come out with the movement. I would love that he will probably even turn the movement to a political party. Then he can have many other people, you know, the political structure to actually, you know, have a, be able to have a political structure where you can have other people contest him and all that so that maybe you can have all that. Yes, probably you might have the ideologies and all that, but there are some I feel like there will be other people, if he made his movement a political party, there will be other people who can probably, you know, champion his ideologies better for him, rather than him himself. Okay. Thank and you. so, yeah, and okay. so, and for people who actually Thank think that, I had Koto Forest saying that, you know, we just need somebody who is young and all that to come and lead us and all that. I think that policies matter, and governance is a very serious business. And so for people to just think that, oh, we just need somebody who is young to come and lead us, it's not, it's a no, no for me. And we need policies that will transform and change the lives of the people in Ghana. And so thank you very much. Thank you. But I think that uh, respectfully, the Kojo guy also did not just leave it at the young. He talked about other things that he thinks, the qualities and he thinks uh, Cheddar has some of them. So because he's not here to respond as host, I need to uh, make that clear. Uh, Ms. Jijo, Ms. Jijo, let's hear you. Good evening, madam. I hope you are fine. Let's hear you with your thoughts. Yeah, good evening, everyone. It's Mr. Jijo. Um, thank you for the... Oh, it's Mr. Okay, let's hear you. Sorry, apologies. No problem. Let's hear you. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I like what you guys are doing here. Um, it's it's very nice. Um, I wanted to ask a question, but since he's not here, I would just like to give my suggestion. I'd like to suggest that um, he gives us more room for suggestions because some of the youths have very good ideas for his... Um, industrial revolution policy so i just wish that he would give us more time to interact with him and share more ideas okay. to, to re yeah. to to that, he says and um, he has a brilliant idea which i agree with he's creating an app where you can go there as a ghanaian youth or anybody who is a uh, part of this system go and ask questions go and put uh, views go and put solutions there and it gets to him directly so that's what he uh, said but when he was ending, if that answers your question. Okay, um, George, George, let's hear you. All right, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity, Austin. And um... Uh, uh, George, be before you go, let me put this caveat and issue this disclaimer. 
please, I don't speak for Nana Kwame Bidiakun or his views are not my views, but because he is not here and I took a decision, let's use the last 15 minutes for others to share their thoughts. It's like when somebody says something which is not here, I just explain uh, or talk about how he said it. So I want to make that clear before people would say that is my view or I'm defending him. I'm not doing that. Thank you. Let's hear you, George. All right. Thank you very much for the opportunity once again, Austin and Kali. And shout outs to everyone here. Good evening. So uh, this is just my observation from um, listening to this piece. And so I generally um, like the fact that we've got a one-on-one -on -one, um, conversation with NKB and um, I felt like a, the answers we got were mostly not satisfactory because most questions were really not answered. Um, but um, I think maybe it could be as a result of time. And so maybe in another space, we can get the opportunity to do that. Moving on, I would also like to also point the fact that we heard a lot about industrialization, industrialization, but then again, we couldn't get clear cuts because just the slogarism in Ghanaian politics is something that we've known. Somebody will come up industrialization, one D, one F, one what, one, all of that. And so all we kept hearing was another slogan of industrialization, industrialization, and there was no backup plan as to how that was going to be materialized. And I felt like that would have also helped with the space. Anyways, moving on also, I don't think that um, Ghani, I think this is the, the point for Ghanaian youth because we, we, we can see that a lot of people are frustrated and this is a wake up for, call for a lot of Ghanaians to really be interested in politics because if you're not even interested in politics, politics in itself will be interested in you. Um, wrapping up also, I think we should also scrutinize all the uh, political leaders coming up and listen to policies, use policies. This is the time to use policy, not the regular slogans. So probe more and then probe more and question. I'm glad that we are now getting the opportunity to connect closer to them. Unlike before that, we could see them so far away. Thanks to Kalije Space, we, they are now just literally a centimeter away from us. So please, uh, not just on ba uh, uh, basis of um, um, he's young or all of those things. Those things don't entice us. Or oh, he looks young, he's nice. He's no, no, please, those things don't work. So let's deal on the policies, the things they are saying they're going to do. Let's probe in. How are they going to do it? The finance and all of those things. So please, um, those are the things that work and not the fact that somebody's just young all of that all right thank you thank you i am jerry john let's hear you i'm jerry john i am jerry john you are our next speaker can you hear me if you can good evening let's hear you if he can speak uh, ken ken you are our next speaker let's hear you Hello, Ken. Oh, sorry. Hello, good evening, Austin. Let's hear you. Hello, Austin, do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Let's hear okay. you. Good evening, Austin. First of all, you are doing a very great job with the host you've been doing. You've been, I've been listening to you host a couple of shows on Twitter, specifically, and you've been doing tremendously well. And I think with Nana Kwame Bidiaku, I... I wasn't extremely satisfied with most of the answers he gave. The, some of the answers were vague, and he didn't really tell us how he wants to implement some of the plans. Although, when you listen to the plans, they sound brilliantly well, but the execution of how he put it in place, if he's elected, he didn't do that. Maybe in future he would explain himself or But I would like to post a question to Kali J on this, since I have the opportunity. Um, he speaks about allowing other political people on their space. And if if there's a chance, I would request, I would wish he could bring Dr. Baumia on the space. And if, uh, yes, that's that's all I have. Yeah, yeah. We, we've talked about that, but you see, it, it, um, it is not just about him. So what he said is who you think you can also reach out to to come. You can, all of you can start a hashtag, uh, get Dr. Baumia on Kali J space, something. He would be doing it from his angle. Okay. Others are also helping him with it. But you know that he, the vice president of Ghana, yeah. um, getting to him to be on a space and all that, because of his time and his campaign, yeah. it becomes quite difficult. Oh, yeah. so, but he's still working on it. And others who can also okay. help. 
I think that okay. is the opportunity. Uh, that's yeah, yeah. But yeah. That um, that... um, can, um, um, before you ask that, okay, yeah, I also year. want to say that um, um, I've I've reached out to um his team okay. to 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 get him on. I've sent. I'm I'm working with some people who I am have access to him to to be able to get him on the space. So hopefully all goes well. But if anybody's on the space here. Has access to the vice president and will be able to help us get him on the space. Um, the platform is always available. We'll be ready to host him. So, but we are still working on it. If you guys can start a hashtag or something, uh, we'll be. Uh, the space is always available as long as we're able to get him on. So we'll be grateful. Okay, Jude. Jude, let's hear you. I think we pick five and we are done. Jude, let's hear you. Okay. Hi everyone. Um. Again, big shouts to Kali. This is like a really big initiative for um, young people to get to talk to their leaders um, in real time. My my first my first thing I have is the first thing I have to say is um, big ups to Cheddar because this is crazy. Like as a young person running for a position like this, you already have the youth listening from day one, right? Because he's young, and we always want to have that. Uh, representation that okay if we push this guy and we know that he's in power he he knows what we are going through so when he gets there he can actually start making the change that's one right so he already has he already has our um, he already has our attention doesn't need to do too much what we need to see right now is we need to we need to know if there's a plan what's the execution plan is there a roadmap to it are there standard kpis that are open for everyone to set so that oh maybe this sector this based on whatever is happening, these are the projected revenues. It's not supposed to go down. It's supposed to be above. So that we know that as Ghanaian citizens, um, there are a lot of people that are not interested in politics. The few of us who voice out when we can is because we are actively trying to push changes in our little spaces, right? He needs to he needs to let us know that okay, if we back you up, are we are we going to end up looking stupid or not? So these are the little things we need to know so that we're like, okay, um, NKB wants to run for president. This is what his roadmap looks like. It's aligned with everybody's, it's aligned, it's aligned, everyone is aligned with what's going on. So what's the way forward? The current government, these are the KPIs we came together to set, like an open, like an open forum where we know that, okay, these are the KPIs each country is supposed to get. Because I believe, I, I'm, I'm a businessman, right? I believe you, if you run everything straight, like as a business person, right, it will surely, it will surely progress. It will surely progress. And the plus two is he's a businessman. That's that's another thing. So he can easily he, the he can easily he can easily navigate his way around it. But the thing is, we need to know what we need to know what those KPIs look like, so that from there we know that oh, this current party is not doing this or not doing that. Then the next thing I need okay. to ask, the next thing I want to know right now is, we've seen what he's done. He's built number one. He has a lot of projects that's going on. We look up to you. That's big, right? But now you want to run for president. You're not saying do something for the young people or maybe I don't know if he's doing something, right? But there are little, little projects that, there are projects that are going on that can become massive to change people's lives, right? I believe he has the right connects. He doesn't even need to be president. Bro, Cheddar can just make a call and broker a sweet partnership that can help people, right? What is he doing for the youth? There is that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think that another person. Uh, thank you. 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 Thank why I wanted to ask why are we asking Cheddar to do that? But no, no, no. This is not coming man, from man, this is not coming from an entitlement point of view. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Yeah. I'm I don't have Bamia. Anytime you have Bamia on the space, call me. I'll ask him the same because I really want to find out. That he should do something for the youth. No, not do something for the youth. Bamia and Cheddar are two different people. Bamia is already in power. Right. So if you're telling me you want to have what a second about, round. I'm, I'm saying that. So Mahama should do something. No, you're for not getting where I'm coming from, bro. Take your time. I'm saying okay. there are two things. One person is in power, one person is not. And another person wants to contest. I'm not I'm not I'm not saying I'm bashing anybody. No. Or I'm not standing for anybody. Let me make that clear. I'm saying Cheddar on his own. I'm just asking from a businessman point of view. Is there something he wants to do? 
If yes, I want you to know that there are people over there who are willing to listen and support from that private point of view because the private sector is big. So let's start building. If he becomes a president, that's plus for us because then we can expand whatever we are already working on. That's what I'm saying. Then the next thing is... Okay.